Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Dear Nana Adusai Poku, dear Christina Sharp, dear scholars, artists, and guests, uh, a very warm welcome to the second symposium of colonial repercussions. Coloniales Erbe uh, is a title in German, the heritage of colonialism, also for Germany, a crucial topic today. In the background, this hour is for the rights of the children in the kitas, so the uh, kindergarten, also an important, important statement. A very special welcome to Peate Gottwald, uh, the mother of Nana Adusaipoko. Thank you very much for being here. Vielen Dank, dass Sie hier heute zu uns gekommen sind. Um, for us, uh, it's very important to reflect uh, a moment. Uh, the Academy of the Arts, with, which is uh, 320 years old now, um, a construction for the arts in the period of the Enlightenment um, and, of course, in concurrence to Paris, uh, to the Academy of the Arts in Paris. For us, as a very Eurocentric, very German institution, a national institution, it was very, very important to reflect the method of uh, developing this concept. And um, we worked together with a team uh, I especially want to name, and if I say we, I'm talking about Judith Weber and me, who, who did this, this program in the academy mainly. We worked together with uh, a team, uh, uh, I want to, to, to name uh, Nikita Davan especially, she is responsible for the third symposium in June, Wolfgang Kalek, uh, General Secretary of European Center for Constitution constitutional and human rights, who did the first um, symposium in January. Thomas Krüger, the president of Federal Agency for Civic Education, it's BPB, it's a um, logo of uh, this institution. He supported us uh, very strongly, not only in content, but also with, with money. Natasha Arkeli, uh, activist and scholar who worked with us. And of course, with Nana Adusaipoku, um, uh, who uh, is responsible and the curator for this symposium today and tomorrow. Let me give one very important aspect. Uh, we are in the arts not in a comfort zone. This um, uh, word of Edward Said is very crucial for our work here. And we have this um, heritage, or let's say this cultural memory, that between 1933 and 1945, um, dozens of artists had to leave the academy because of a Jewish descendants or communist background. A very famous artists like Heinrich Mann or Käthe Kollwitz. So we are very aware of the political aspects um, in the arts, and we are very aware also that institutions uh, who are created in the, in the period of the Enlightenment are not on the safe side. And um, what is crucial for us in, in doing this, this program, uh, and also uh, you can be sure we will go on with this uh, after the, the three symposiums, is that in the same time of the period of the Enlightenment, where we created the basis of our understanding of human rights, of um, the fundaments of a democratic society, of freedom, and of um, the same rights for everybody, racism, colonialism, slave trade, genocide has been created. And this is, is a continuous project of, of the Enlightenment period uh, where we are dedicated to and where we try from the arts in the dialogue with the scholars uh, in the human sciences to see the, what strategies, what possibilities, what necessities we have to respect to go on in this process 
of enlightenment. I think the canon of European thoughts has to involve um, and uh, very, very popular and very crucial also for the curriculums of our schools. Um, names like Franz Fanon, like Aimé Césaire, like Edouard Glisson and Stuart Hall and many others. And I just want to, to, to refer to this very crucial experience of Franz Fanon when he came uh, to France, to Lyon, to the city of Lyon, knowing that he, as a French citizen, wanted to work with the others to re-establish a democratic new country that he made this experience to be recognized as the other. I stumbled, I burst apart, he wrote, this falling and losing of one's body under the ballistics of the racist expression is a fundamental experience which is connected to the irrationalism of the European uh, culture and of the European periods today. So, concerned about this situation, I think we are in the center of this symposium and I'm very, very happy that we could work together with Nana, uh, who had this very important project in Witte de Witt, in the Center of Contemporary Art in Rotterdam, No Humans Involved, uh, which is a kind of a starting point for this project here. I have to say I'm very proud that you are grown up in West Germany, what we call Ruhrgebiet, um, that you uh, got your PhD at the Humboldt University, um, that you uh, did a great job at uh, Zürich uh, uh, University of the Arts and that you are involved in the systems even if you are uh, looking to the other side of the Atlantics uh, where the, the story of the Black Atlantic of course has a complete different um, uh, actuality and, and presence than we can have it here in Germany. And to say one last word, um, for us, um, the point of perspectives of contemporary history in Germany is the Holocaust. So there is no way to, to, to go out of that in, in Germany. But uh, when we did uh, a huge project, um, Uncertain States, in nine, uh, 2016 and 17, we uh, developed with our archives this memory of the uncertain states in uh, 33, 45, the experience of exile, of racism, of brutal um, inhuman methods uh, of destructing cultures and, and, uh, and the life of millions of people. Uh, but the problems which came up in uh, 2015 and 2016 hasn't, hasn't been analyzed uh, only by this perspective. This was not the the, the central idea. It was the colonialism which has been part of also German history in uh, 19th century and of course uh, 20th century and which is a very, very important point to bring in attention in every institution in Germany. It's not just uh, something for House of World Cultures. It's not just for one theater like the Gorky Theater today. It's something uh, all institutions in Germany has to work on. And um, I am coming from the free scene and I, I always was a very strong critic uh, of, of the institutions. Today, I am sure that the institutions are more important than ever before because to have a house like this here at Pariser Platz um, is a very important statement. And also if we have this changement in Germany with the AfD, with the right wing policies, um, we are facing uh, a new period of racism, uh, of nationalism, uh, of chauvinism. Um, we need these institutions to, to, uh, to create a kind of resistance. And uh, I understand this work of colonial repercussions as a very important resistance to what um, 
is, is happening actually in, in, in Germany. And tomorrow, I just want to give you this connection. Uh, the, the national demonstration of the AfD is starting at Hauptbahnhof, so there will be a lot of police around. And they try to do the main demonstration, the main announcement of their statements on the other side of the Brandenburger Tor, so in, in the other direction. And um, so the, the nationalistic racist movement is very, very near to us. On the other hand, there are 65 institutions, also the academy, who are organizing a, a counter -demonstra demonstration, uh, which will arrive same time here at Pariser Platz. Um, and um, I, I think we have to be aware that, uh, uh, that we have to touch uh, uh, on, the, on the level of, um, of thoughts and actions um, uh, the, all the aspects of, of post-colonialism, but at the same time we have to be very aware that we have to find strategies to, to confront um, the main um, players in, in policies and um, in institutions. I thank you very much for being here. I'm very much looking forward and um, I want to give the platform to Nana, uh, my good friend uh, since 2012. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Johannes, for this very generous introduction. Um, let me open my notes. Okay, technology. Here we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so I already thought, um, thanked Johannes, but I also have to thank all of the participants for agreeing to contribute to this event and share their knowledge and passion, as well as the technicians who have helped to set up the equipment and accommodate all the artists' needs. My thanks also goes to Timur, um, who has been an amazing support as part of, oh, there he is, as part of the PR um, for performances of No Thingness and who also will be the video videographer for the next two days. But one person who has really been the logistical and administrative powerhouse here is Judith Weber. And without her, performances of Nothingness would not have been realized in this way. And I really, really need you to give her a really warm uh, applause. <laughs> Okay, so before I start, start, I will do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a change in the program. So when you look into the keynote for tomorrow morning, Che Gossett unfortunately had to cancel their participation, but I am super happy to announce that Julia Phillips, an amazing sculptor and thinker, um, will be giving the keynote tomorrow morning and the talk will be called Anonymous Bodies and she will um, talk about her sculpture work, her process and basically being part of the black diaspora um, having grown up in Germany but also um, now being based in New York. Um, to all of those who are participating in workshops that involve movement, walking and uh, theater practices, um, please think about bringing some water. So we won't be able to provide water for you, but please have in the back of your mind that you may be sweating, you may be moving, and it's a very hot day. We don't want you to dehydrate. Um, downstairs, you can find the uh, C and um, Center for Unfinished Business, which was curated by Yvette Mutumba and Julia Grossitz, right here underneath over here in the main entrance. Um, it's a beautiful space where you can actually gain more knowledge, indulge and read over the next two days. Um, yes, in any case, if you are exhausted and you don't want to sit down anymore, there's the possibility to 
actually listen to everything that is happening here over there at the sculptural garden. There will be live sound streaming. You can refresh yourself, just that you know that. Food you'll find downstairs. There will be beverages over there for you here at the bar. Um, we have all gender restrooms right there. There, will be, there are signs um, behind this uh, glass door. Um, if you need translations, please take your um, headsets or pick up the headsets um, on the first level at the um, cloak room space. Um, and then, very jovially, I would like to remind you that tonight, uh, Ayn, Bailey, and Raps will share their DJ sets with us in the club room upstairs, and that will give us some time to, actually time for me to find, like, really chill and enjoy myself and mingle with you and answer questions and just, you know, be social. Okay. So this was the housekeeping. Now, again, I would like to warmly welcome and greet you with excitement to the Academy of Arts Second Platform Performances of No Thingness. I am looking forward to the next two days not only because there are so many familiar, and I'm, I'm actually seeing people right now who I haven't seen for about 10 years, so I'm, it's kind of emotional. Um, so because not only because there are so many familiar and dear faces in the room who have been part of my process, personal development, as well as forming of thought, who have, <clears throat> who have been an inspiration, who also, but also because of the fact that this project was first discussed about a year ago when I participated during the previous project, Uncertain States, which led to an enriching conversation with Johannes and Judith. It is even longer ago that Johannes and I sat in 2012 with a large delegation of cultural producers, including Thomas Krüger, on a bus during a tour organized by the Federal Agency of Civic Education. Amongst many subjects, we talked about loss of loved ones and discussed the importance of decolonial critique, a question that we kept returning to since, is how to push the discussion on Germany's colonial past and its repercussions in the center of attention for our contemporary societies. It is an unfinished conversation as the late Stuart Hall would call the critical engagement with Europe's imperial past and presence. To acknowledge the past in the present, or the past as a position, as Christina Sharp reminds us in her book In the Wake on Blackness and Being, is a practice, never contained to a single moment, a fluid practice that has its own temporality. I find great solace in performances of no thingness, because we are not living in a time in which a discursive event like this is a regular part of Germany's cultural landscape. And I emphasize that the next two days will mark a historic moment in the history of this institution, with artists, speakers, and cultural producers who are all part of the black diaspora. It is, of course, saddening having to, point out, having to point this out. But given that right-wing sentiment and populism will be at our doorsteps protesting on Sunday, our gathering here, our resilience and presence is cause for celebration. And I will unpack later why I am emphasizing this. I find great solace in the fact that it is possible to organize performances of no thingness at the Academy of Arts in the city of Berlin. The city of Berlin, where the African continent was divided in 1878 between European powers during the so-called Congo Conference, just over there, the city in which I studied and institutions that condemned less than a century before people of African descent to inferior objects, unworthy to be part of humanity, institutions that are still in neglect about their colonial past and vital role in and gain from global imperialism, whilst perpetuating forms of exclusion into the contemporary. 
The post-colonial theorist Paul Geroy called this colonial melancholia, a form of forgetting that allows the representation of the past without accountability, and instead a nostalgia for the times when everything seemed so much better. But the question is, for whom better, and whose narratives are forgotten, marginalized, suppressed, and erased? So let me give you an example, and I'm going to freestyle this for a little bit. This building over here, the Hotel Adlon, don't ask me when it was built, but it was in the late 19th century, was predominantly funded with uh, money from the German colonies. You can even find a fountain in there, which is a one-on-one replica of a gift that was coming from Deutsch Ostafrika. So when they decided to resurrect this, this is exactly how the original building looked like. Of course, they wouldn't tell you that story, what is actually remembered in, in this very, very important site. Just an example. So Berlin was deeply formative for me as a person, as well as for my intellectual journey, because my education did not necessarily take place at the university. It took place in the periphery through the exchange with other people of African descent who were equally pulled to German, Germany's capital. It took place in queer bars and transgenial CSDs, where identity was consistently questioned and problematized. This circle of friends exposed me to questions and, analyti and an analytical view at forms of exclusion that I need to highlight when I talk about my contemporary work. And I'm very honored that some of them are part of performances of nothingness. And so are friends that have deeply influenced my thought and perception of the world, whether during my time in London, New York, or the Netherlands. I am emphasizing this aspect because the practice of decolonization is an ongoing project for black people on the African continent as well as in the black diaspora. This platform two of colonial repercussions performances of nothingness is less interested to counter but to establish a conversation alongside the ongoing debates of reparation on reparation in Germany. Decolonization is a chrono-political project, non-linear, and formed through simultaneity. Performances of nothingness follows my previous investment in the art of the black diaspora and the question of existence as a black being in the contemporary. The difficulty to curate the symposium was to think about these different temporalities, which signify our existences as marked and unmarked bodies. In other words, the chronopolitical dissonance that has been produced through systemic forms of exclusion has led to a profound gap in what people should know about our shared histories and what is actually part of our popular memories of nation states. So what do I mean by that? First, black critical theory, which is to say critical theory, is very advanced and by now, due to hegemonic dynamics, hard to translate for those to whom the subject may be new. Second, post, whilst post-colonial theory, decolonial theory and its practices and the question of reparation experiences a resurgence in Germany's cultural and intellectual field, people of African descent, whether in the diaspora or on the African continent, are consistently producing, producing aesthetics and forms that push aesthetics and forms and canons and the boundaries, whether it is in trend or receives particular attention through allocated fun funding. It is part of an everyday means of survival to enter what Edouard Glissant called the imaginary. The symposium is inspired by and engages with debates in critical theory around Afro-pessimism, a debate that is immersed in the question whether or not black human beings live either in social or in political death, or, as Christina argues, are consistently death-bound. The notion of no-thingness or nothingness 
should not be mistaken with Jean-Paul Sartre's work nor Martin Heidegger, Heidegger's understanding of nothingness. But you may get involved in their work to understand where Fred Moten is coming from, amongst many other theorists like Sadia Hartman and Hortense Billes and the already mentioned Franz Fanon. What Fred Moten proposes in his acclaimed essay, Blackness and Nothingness, Mysticism of the Flesh, is, which is a response to the claim by Frank B. Wilderson that we live in social death and that there is no outside of the master-slave narrative that seems to still dominate our lives. I would like to share with you a quote of a very complex, of this very complex essay that inspired the title of this talk. It's a longer quote, but Fred Moten is always good to quote, so beautifully written, right beyond. So I start to quote, what is nothingness? What is thingliness? What is blackness? What's the relationship between blackness, thinglingness, nothingness, and the de or regenerative operations of what Deleuze might call a life in common? Where do we go? By what means do we begin to study blackness? Can there be an aesthetic sociology or a social poetics of the universal machine? Our aim, even in the face of the brutally imposed difficulties of black life, is cause for celebration. This is not because celebration is supposed to make us feel good or make us feel better. Though, there would be nothing wrong with that. It is rather because the cause for celebration turns out to be the condition of possibility of black thought, which animates the black operations that will produce the absolute overturning, the absolute overturning of this motherfucker out. <laughs> Celebration is the essence of black thought, the animation of black operations, which are, in the first instance, our undercommon, underground, submarine sociality. Quote end. Moten's proposition which I recommend for you to read in full, that we, will in, that we live in a state of political death, is something that has also, in my observation and research, led to a different aesthetic, a different type of nihilism and opacity in the arts and beyond. I also want to foreground that this refusal is neither exclusively US American, sorry, 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 I jumped. This aesthetic is based in a sense of refusal, a refusal to perform blackness as a spectacle, but to open queries that allow us to create space with each other and for each other as black people. I also want to foreground that this refusal is neither exclusively US Amer an, an exclusively US American discourse that we will engage with here. To accuse curators of African um, Afro-American centrism when it comes to a discussion of blackness and colonialism in Europe means to think in and through geography and nationalism. Oh, this is so kind, thank you. <laughs> I was like, please don't stop me, this is so important. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I am sweating up here. Okay, so where was I? I was in my defense speech. Uh, okay. Um, I'm starting with the accusations again. To accuse curators... <laughs> to accuse curators of Afro-American centrism when it comes to a discussion of blackness and colonialism in Europe means to think in and through geography and nationalism and is an imperialist tool of separation. If the black diaspora means one thing to me, then the contestation of those kind of boundaries, the crossing of those boundaries consistently being fluid. We may experience cultural specificities, but none of these can be detached from imperialism, slavery, occupation, and settler colonialism. If the African-American experience has been and is still deeply shaped by a group of people, then we have to call out the roots of this experience and we are actually in the center of it. By which I mean European settlers who brought their ideas, including their goods, to the Americas, their goods. 
whilst at the same time, the European experience of black people has never been detached from approaches of liberation on the African continent, nor from attempts of civil rights approaches in the United States, but all of the, not only in the United States, but all of the Americas. To disconnect us means to destroy our powerful critical potential. So by centering black subjectivity, knowledges, and artistry, I'm aiming to provide for a conversation that is most often situated outside of mainstream institutions. I hence want to challenge you as an audience to become witness and participant, not only by moving through the building, finding places to position yourself in the space during some of the performances, but also to allow you to be present with the artists, to move together, to be insecure, close read, and foremost, listen. I would like you to understand that this event is an offering. I have approached the notion of curating from a place of care, which is deeply inspired by Christina Sharp and riffs, in a recent conference, riffs on a recent conference that was curated by my brilliant and close London-based friend, René Moussaï. To use the word curator here may be misleading. If I reconnect it to its Latin origin, which is curare, meaning to cure. There is no healing from the past, but there is to take care of the way how the past and present are narrated. Narrative is an act of witnessing. witnessing. It is part of the historical record. The narrations that will be offered over the next two days may not, be, may not represent what a traditional Western understanding of history may impose. They are offerings that challenge you to leave Western epistemologies because blackness is poised to constantly disrupt both internally the unity of the spectator but also the boundaries that exist between people. When I sat down with a dear friend and curator, Alina Katzoff, in, Berlin, in New York City on a spring eve in a restaurant in Soho, I was saddened about the recent death of my father, Kwame Idusse Poku. I apologized for my crying. She looked into my puffy eyes and said, it is important, Nana, that you have a witness in this process of grieving or witnesses and the challenges that you are facing. I could not have felt more held and affirmed, but foremost, I could not have felt more present in the now and in the future. To witness, it means to be present. It means to have responsibility. It means to acknowledge, the pro to be producer of a shared experience and not just consumer. It means to be held accountable when key aspects of the story get deliberately left out. And with this said, I um, please, <laughs> sorry, with this said, please enjoy and indulge in performances of No Thingness, because I surely will. <laughs> so now, I would let me introduce you to our first keynote speaker, Christina Sharp. Um, I'm going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> Um, I don't remember how I learned about Christina Sharp and her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being. But I do remember my physical, embodied, and intellectual response when I read the first two chapters on a plane to the Venice Biennial last year. I remember how my partner, Nick Kay, shared with me their experiences whilst reading her book how we talked about our diasporic connections as black people in the world, how our being together also unions the African continent, Ghana, the Caribbean, and the United States. I remember how difficult it was to make my way through her descriptions of black death. Naming points of no returns, passages, and asterix. It's historical continuations and how much all of the geographies, or what she calls autography, mark so many, if not all, of our lives. There has seldom been a piece of literature 
and critical thought and proposition of practice that has captured me in such a strong way and resonated with all the questions, really literally all the questions and challenges that I experience as an educator in the university context and beyond, in relationships with the world and in transnational catastrophes that mark our everyday lives as black subjects. So when I asked Christina how she was able to write this book, which is a deep critique of contemporary societies within the academy, she looked at me, which is us, Nick and I, in Hamburg in 2017, and she said, I just did it. <laughs> Her response stuck, me, stuck with me ever since, and there's no other way that I can translate this response, but sheer insistence to make our lives part of what we call presence. And with our lives, I mean the ones who are gone and the ones that will come. So now to the sort of formal part. Christina Sharp is, will be professor at York University in Toronto starting in September, I suppose, right? Um, so there will be a transition, a big transition in her life. I already pointed out her second book. Please, please, if you can, you have to. I mean, there's no way around. Um, in the Wake on Blackness and Being was published by Duke University Press in November 2016 and was named The Guardian's newspaper and The Walrus and In the Walrus as one of the best books of 2016. Her first book, Monstrous Intimacies, also please read. I mean, read anyways, read everything. Making Post-Slavery Subject was sub published in 2010, also by Duke University Press. She is currently completing the critical introduction to the collective poems of Dion Brand and two monographs, Black Still Life and Refusing Necrotopia. And today she will share with us part of Black Still Life. Thank you, Christina, for your insistence, for your love and care of black life. I'm getting very emotional. <sighs> for your presence here today and for sharing another chapter, another beginning of a new wonderful project that will push us collectively into other imaginaries. I'm deeply humbled and honored to have you here with us today and to become a witness <laughs> of your thought. 